certain things that you complete and they can't go any further than that. So that this is the only thing which is waiting for these institutions to be built on Mount Carmel. And then we can say everything is ready. And that what Chogi Effendi says in that same letter is also interesting. He says two things will happen. One thing is in the Baha'i world, and what is he talking in the Baha'i world? He said the evolution, you see he uses the word evolution, the evolution of local and national institutions of the faith. The evolution. In other words, our lo- he does not say the consolidation of the local and national institution. He does not say the uh, progress of the national and international institution, uh, local and national institutions. He says the evolution. Evolution means it reaches a different characteristic. It, in other words, the cause of Baha'u'llah will emerge in that way. Well, friends, uh, having said this much, uh, we must remember that uh, our task is to make sure to use that overcoat that I was telling you today, the overcoat that this African man dreamt of, which is this marvelous protection which Shoghi Effendi has given to us, protection for ourselves. The protection of every Baha'i is within the institutions, is to turn to the institutions of the faith of Baha'u'llah. That is your protection. There is no other protection. There is no other protection. Keep yourself outside it. You will feel just like that African, nude in the street, with all the dirt coming over him. That is what will happen. This is what I say. He has given us a refuge, a marvelous refuge that we should turn to. And even the local assemblies are turning, are giving us the wrong decisions. We abide by it, and as Abdul Baha says, eventually the right will be done. Now, here are where the test comes in here. The test that I was going to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about in great detail. Um, I have in here some material that if I tell you, it will be very, again, uh, shattering to you. (laughs) What Baha'u'llah has said again. Yesterday I told you to be staggering uh, statements which we did go through. Today also is similar, but I, and I don't want to go into it. But Baha'u'llah has revealed the tablet. Let me first of all talk about this. All right, and we will see about these things. Uh, you know that uh, test is one of the ne- one of the uh, fundamental um, laws of creation, both physical and spiritual. Uh, everything in this life which moves physically, goes through a test. Uh, the, moment, uh, the moment you move, uh, or as you call it for every action, there is a reaction. Don't you say that in physics or something like that? Um, the minute you move, you get on your bicycle, for instance, and move. What happens? The wind will resist you. And the faster you go, the more the resistance of the air. He says, if you're going fast, I won't let you. And if you go very fast, like these aeroplanes go twice the speed of sound, they become red hot because of this tremendous friction which they create for them. So you see, friends, in in nature, tests are there. In the world of humanity also, there are tests. Uh, Every human being is tested all the time. But these tests depend on what level you are, you are living. If you are on a level of materialism, uh, your tests are all material things. And you go through all kinds of difficulties. There is nobody who has no difficulty when you think of it in that way. But as soon as you enter into the faith, you will be tested. Straight away you will be tested. But most of the time, we are not aware that we are being tested. Most of the time, we are not aware. You know, for instance, when I'm looking at you, and I dislike you, 
I'm not you now. I, 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 I look at you now. I look at you. I, I look at you. No, not you. I, would, I am being tested right away. And I have not passed the test. And if you don't pass the test, you will remain in a low level and become, you can never grow. You just are there in the bottom. Like a school, you know, you go there. And this is why our tests are today, the administrative order of Baha'u'llah creates tests for us. It is the greatest testing grounds that a Baha'i can come across. With. First of all, one of the greatest on an individual level, often the test of a Baha'i is another Baha'i. That's one thing. The second thing is that our institutions uh, create tests for us. As soon as you go and sit around the table of the house of the, of the spiritual assembly and you begin to consult, you're being tested. Now you either pass the test or you don't pass the test. If you sit there with the spirit of love, and it's easy to love some people you like, although it's not necessarily a good motive. You see, I may like you. Okay, this time. Uh, but, uh, but that is for a wrong motive, maybe. Because I like you, I, I love you then. It's a wrong motive. But in any case, it's easier to love somebody you like. But it's not easy to love somebody that you work with and you don't love. And that is where we have to struggle. To pray and continuously pray so that um, we are able to overcome this problem. So you see, that's where, that's where the test begins. So in the consultation, what happens? The minute this person who talks, and I don't like him, I, I react to his way of doing things. I belittle him. I do all kinds of things in relation to him. Even if I don't show my displeasure uh, with my verbally, I might look at him badly. And even if I don't look at him badly, in my, in my heart I might not like him. These are tests that we go through. And not until we pass these tests can we become really happy people as individuals and also good institutions. The good institution is the one whose members love one another and they carry on their work on the basis of love. So this is one of the greatest tests that come across in this day. But the test um, have been very great in this dispensation. Now this is only the test that we go through now. Uh, the test that originally Baha'u'llah refers to it uh, in this tablet which I brought for you. It's a, tra it's a provisional translation and I don't want to read all of it to you or some of it to you even because it's very strong uh, tablet. Um, I may just refer to it a little bit. Um, you will find that uh, the test of the believers has been so strong in the early days of the faith particularly. It meant that many people had to give their lives. That is the greatest test, you know. The greatest test is this, that you are brought there before the executioner. Many, many believers did this. Brought them to the executioner. At that moment you have a choice of saying, I don't believe. And recant your faith. Go home. Live with your family. Or, say, I believe, and then you give your life. And that is the test that comes to the believers, you see. But Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi have said that for the Western world, the tests will be mental, mental tests. And friends, we are right now going through a period of mental tests in the West. It has been there before through the covenant breaking of the believers for some years, both in the East and the West. And those tests, the believers have uh, responded very well to it, the story of covenant breaking. But now we are entering also a stage when both from within and without the Baha'i community, we will be tested. And these tests come to us in very... Um, a very, um, not, not clear ways, sometimes in hidden ways, these tests appear into our, in our lives. And we are confronted with it. And the test is this. A basic of it, I'm telling you. The basic of it is this. Um, Baha'u'llah has come 
has given us his covenant, has given us his teachings. He has told us we must recognize him. I was saying the other day, this is the story of love. You have to recognize him and then fall in love with him. That is the challenge to all of us. And then he says, obey me. Obey me. Whatever I have said, you must carry it out. This is a test that some people say, I cannot obey. Certain things I like and I obey, but certain things I cannot obey. I want to break some of the laws, I do it. Uh, I do not agree with so many things that Baha'u'llah has said or Abdul Baha has said. It does not confirm with my way of thinking. These are the tests that the believers can go through. And the tests are not something that is going to endure for a long time. It is even instantaneous. The moment you think, ah, I can't agree with this. You see? That's the test. Right away, immediately. To the extent that you are ready to accept and acknowledge that he is right. And after all, my mind is not always perfect. And submit yourself. And as I said yesterday, not until we submit ourselves. When you come across a statement that you find you cannot agree with it, don't resist it. Accept it. Say, this is Baha'u'llah's words, these are Abdul Baha's words, they are from God. I, I, I accept it. Although I don't understand it, but then pray about it. And then I can assure you that you will come a time that you will understand the wisdom of the thing that you are already having a problem with. And friends, this is a great test. And it's a very subtle way that comes in your, in your ways. This is how the covenant breakers acted in the time of Abdul Baha. You know how they did it? Let me tell you how they did it. I'm not saying that this is happening right now, although it's happening probably in a different way. Today, the test that is going on, and Shoghi Effendi has said these tests are from within and without. In his letter, uh, four or five months before he passed away, he, he wrote a very important letter, and he said that it is for the hands of the cause of God and the National Assemblies to get together and to protect the cause of God from the assault which will come to it from within and from without. Now, what is the, how did they do that? Uh, Abdul Baha, in his will and testament, he says, don't think that anybody who is going to, I'm paraphrasing the whole idea, he says that if anybody wants to come and um, undermine uh, the cause of God, undermine the covenant, he's not going suddenly, straight away, going and oppose it. He says he will come in subtle ways. In subtle ways, he introduces himself. And he begins to sow the seeds of doubt in the hearts and minds of the believers. And if you are not steadfast, if you are not armored, you have to have an armor, and that armor is the covenant. And not until you have that armor can you really be able to reject it. A healthy body will reject all the outside germs and viruses if it is healthy. This is what we have to develop, a health for ourselves. But, you know, I just tell you, it came to my mind, when I say the subtle ways, I'm not going to talk about the present day and how subtly there are people in the Baha'i community who are trying to influence people in subtle ways to create doubts in the hearts of people in a very simple and subtle way. All right, I'm not going to talk about this now. But I'm talking about the past history. You know, during the time of Abdul Baha, when Mizah Muhammad Ali wanted to, to sow the seed of doubts, in the minds of the simple Baha'is. And often the simple, the naive people are the target. You know what they used to do? They first of all <laughs> announced throughout the whole Baha'is uh, of, the, of the world uh, of, of Akka and uh, all the, in the Holy Land that Abdul Baha had claimed to be a manifestation of God. And therefore they, they use this verse of the Abbas, which says, if anybody claims to be a manifestation of God, he prays that God will raise someone who will deal un mercilessly with him. That's what they announced it. They, 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 this became a rumor that Abdul Baha has, has claimed to be a manifestation of God and he's going to destroy the cause of Baha'u'llah. Now, in order to influence the uh, simple-minded people, what they used to do was this. They used to go to the simple heart, would send somebody to the simple hearted person. 
And they would go and say to him, what a wonderful day it is. What a wonderful day it is. Have you seen the power, the majesty of the master, the majesty of Abdul Baha? He is really divine in origin. His divinity is no doubt about it. His greatness is so and so. And they were going to completely draw a picture of Abdul Baha being a divine. So, then this person begins to doubt. Well, how can Abdul Baha say such a thing? After all, he cannot be a divine person and, and become a, a manifestation of God. Doubts enter into his mind. Another person goes and supports that again. More and more and more. Then when they see that this person's doubt has entered into it, they send somebody else to him. And then they say, look here, this is not right. You know, we must do something about it. We must stop this. We cannot let Abdul Baha do this. We must stop this. And so this per- we will help you. Let us get together. And you can see how in this way, they have been sowing the seed. This is one of the ways of sowing the seed of doubt in the hearts of people. And uh, sometimes they would come across, for instance, for instance and would say that uh, Mirza Abul Fah, they would begin to praise Mirza Abul Faz, the great Baha'i scholar. And everybody thought, oh, if the covenant breakers praise Mirza Abul Faz, it means he's one of them. You see? And this is how they would become. The, the seeds of doubt would enter into the minds of people. I'm saying these things, of course, part is the past history. We don't, we are not interested in it. So Abdul Baha says, for the Western Baha'is, and Shoghi Effendi says, the tests will be mental. For the East, naturally, there have been the tests of martyrdom, and uh, this is one of the tests that come along. Now, these. Test we can overcome by being, as we say, steadfast in the covenant. Steadfastness in the covenant means this. The first verse, the first chapter, the first paragraph of the Kitab al-Aqdas, if that is your guide in your life, you're safe. Baha'u'llah says, recognize me, and then obey me. That's a full stop after that. <laughs> this is protection. This is the covenant. This is the protection. And then there are degrees. There are some who are in the heights of steadfastness in the covenant. There are some who are lower down because there are relative terms. Steadfastness in the covenant is a relative term. Some of the early believers have reached the height of steadfastness in the covenant. The height. They, 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 the pinnacle of steadfastness in the covenant. I'll come across, now just get my mind, one person. And that is Dr. Yunus Khan who was Abdul Baha's secretary for nine years in Akka. And he reached that pinnacle of faith and steadfastness. You know, there was a story that uh, he, he has written about it. He says that, um, uh, I'll just give you one example of it now. I do not know whether these are the subjects we should go in. What time is it? 8, 8.40? Am I right? Do we still have time? Oh, why? That's too much. Really, too much time. I don't want to keep on talking because it makes you tired. Um, I wanted to tell you this, that, that, that just to show you that what, is, what was it, what Dr. Yunus Khan's steadfastness in the covenant was like. Just to give you the pinnacle of it, I'm saying, the, high, the highest form of steadfastness in the covenant. There was a time that Mirza Awajan, which was Baha'u'llah's amanuensis, rebelled against the cause, you know, he became a covenant breaker. And he wrote a lot of letters um, addressed to the believers, all um, trying to, um, in, against Abdul Baha. And these letters came into the hands of the believers. And they brought it to the person of Abdul Baha. And they showed it to him. Look at Mirza Awajan, he has written these letters. One day Abdul Baha invited all the friends to come to his house. And he left these letters on table. And he said, one by one, come and see his handwriting what he has written. And he told them what he has written. Come and see. So every believer went forward and he saw with his own eyes the handwriting of Mirza or John, which was familiar to everybody, saying these things. Dr. Yunus Khan was standing at the end of the room. He did not go forward. Abdul Baha said, come and see. He said, no. 
He said, come and see. Several times. He said, no. He said, I order you to come and see. He said, no. He said, why do you not come? He said, I trust your words more than my own eyes. If you say these are the words of Ms. John, that's more proof to me than my own eyes. Abdul Baha said, I still want you to come and see. <laughs> so he went forward and he showed him the letter. He saw it. Ten years later, in Tehran, he met one of the prince, a prince of the realm who was very much interested in the faith. And he had studied a great deal about the faith. And he had heard so much about Mirza Ahajan, Baha'u'llah's secretary. And he wanted to know really if he had written those letters. He asked Dr. Yunus Khan, did he write those letters? He said, yes. Did you see it with your own eyes? Yes. He then realized what Abdul Baha said, I still come and see it. You see? <laughs> he said, if I had said no, that wouldn't be right for him. So friends, this is what this, I showed you the pinnacle of steadfastness in the culture. When he says so, I accept it. I don't understand it. Okay, you have time to understand it. Read more writings, ask questions. You will understand it eventually. But don't rebel against it. This is really the greatest protection that we have. Is to turn to the center of the cause. To try and um, obey the teachings and writings. And also remember that raincoat, the administrative order of Baha'u'llah, which we can, should carry it always with us. And don't put it on your arms carrying it, but put it on. It is this, it's a marvelous dream that this man had, and it was so beautiful, expressing exactly what are the attitudes should be. Now about tests again. Um, as I said, I wanted and I hesitated to read this tablet for you. Some of it I read it. But because this age is a very, because it's a very great revelation. Baha'u'llah says that um, because of the greatness of this revelation, the tests are also very great. The tests are also very great. He wrote a tablet when he was in Baghdad to a princess. A princess, uh, Shams Jahan. Shams Jahan was a princess. She was the granddaughter of Tati Ali Shah. And she was very much attracted to Tahirah. And she became a believer. A very, very outstanding believer. I've written something about him in one of these books, The Revelation of Baha'u'llah. And he came to Baghdad and attained the presence of Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah revealed for him, his, his, he wrote a tablet called Lohe Fitne, because this was his her title, Fitne. Fitne means test. And Baha'u'llah wrote this tablet of Fitna, which is not yet translated into English and probably it will be the House of Justice will have to approve whether it would be appropriate to translate it now because it is really a very very difficult in this tablet Baha'u'llah says that this revelation is so great that everything in this creation will be tested I read some of the words for it this is a provisional translation which is done by my brother Habib he says, this verily is a test. I mean, this is part of it. I'm just picking up passages for you. This verily is a test that will lay hold on the entire creation. Both visible and invisible. This verily is a test that will cause mankind to be seized with perturbation and the minds of men to be confounded and the secrets of things split open and the souls of the sincere among the, his servants dumbfounded. Say this verily is a test by reason of which the throne of glory will be sorely shaken. The throne of glory, which is the throne of God. And the inmates of the pavilions of loftiness, that is the next world, agitated. And the concourse of the spirit within the domains of everlasting holiness lost in bewilderment. Say this verily is a test whereby God will put to proof every atom in existence. Every created being, every dweller in the heavens and on the earth, every accomplished man of learning. 
This verily is a test by which the honored servants of God and his sincere lovers and the angels that enjoy near access to him and the concourse on high will, one and all, be subjected to trials. And he goes on to say so many things, page after page. Uh, say this verily is a test whereby all those who profess belief in and love for God, the help in peril, the exalted, will be proved through the appearance of, the tran- of this transcendent, this glorious and well-pleasing beauty. They will be tested. And he goes on to say that he will split a hair into a thousand pieces. These are his own words. Every hair will be split into a thousand splits, each of which will be subjected to trial. Now, I always wondered what does this mean. I mean, after all, it's too much to think about it. As I said, this is a very strong tablet of Baha'u'llah, about ten pages, uh, full of these similar statements, saying that everything in this world will be tested. And I often wondered what it means that uh, every atom will be, every... every um, the hair split it into a thousand pieces. And then I realized that when you split it into a thousand pieces, you get the atom. And the atom is already under test, if you look at it. If you look at the way that the atom works, the, the, the tremendous force which exists there, you see, and then the reaction. This, this, there is always, always being tested, all the time. In fact, as he said, every atom will be tested in this age. So that uh, the tests are with us. Everything we do, every way we, whatever we do, it's, it's a test for us. And I feel that it's very important that uh, we should become um, armored with the covenant. That's the part which we are interested in, really, to armor uh, ourselves, to arm ourselves with this um, armor of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, somebody asked a question, I forgot, but... Oh, yes, George Townsend, yes, yes. Yes, he said, well, I have a few minutes, uh, of course, they're asking me to say about George Townsend. May I say something? Oh, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I, I tell you, I'm going to take my coat off now. Oh, well, my, I'll take it off, okay. don't worry. Come on, my just... Okay. You know that uh, George Stans. Well, I tell you, one of the about about George Thompson was that I met him, as David says, in Manchester teaching conference. I was there, and I saw a man of great uh, humility and great uh, personality. You could see both together, combined. He was, he was um, if you entered the room, uh, you would immediately notice that this is, this, is an, uh, this is a very outstanding person. Yet you could see he was humble. I never heard him say, I. Never heard him say, I have done this or I have done that. And, uh, or I am a scholar. <laughs> this is one of the, con- one of the characteristics of a true Baha'i scholar, is that he will never, if you tell him he's a scholar, he'll be very upset. And so, he was the essence of humility, and also, uh, very, um, uh, he used to write to me then after that, we used to correspond when we were in, in Scotland, because I was in Scotland for about six months. And during those six months, he used to write, I've got his letters, quite a lot of letters he wrote to me. And he was asking, uh, from me, he was asking so many questions, and I thought, gosh, he should know these things himself, why does he ask me these things? But anyhow, we used to correspond quite a lot in that way. And uh, when the first day that uh, arrived in the, in, the, in the North Wall, in the, what is it, uh, the ship arrived from Glasgow, um, in Dublin. Um, he was there to take us to a guest house. No, no, not in Dunleary. We came to, uh, through the city. Huh? North Wall, North Wall, yeah. And uh, then we came to uh, the O'Connell Bridge. 
And there we, we had to stop because uh, uh, this was a period of unemployment. Great unemployment in the country. And thousands of unemployed were there to demonstrate. And they would sit on the, on the bridge. They would not let a car pass through for an hour. Certain hours of the day. And then the police would take them away. Another hundred would sit down again. So we had to stay there for about an hour. And that was the scene which welcomed me into a country coming to get a job. <laughs> in those days it was very unusual and especially being a Persian now it was alright if I was German specialist or something like that I'm a Persian I was probably the first Persian who came to Ireland uh, before that this was Manu Cher Zabi who came for a few months and then he went back but, uh, but George was the one who really gave us a marvelous uh, support from the very beginning. And uh, I had a letter also from Shoghi Effendi which, uh, can, which assured me that I, I would be able to I'll be successful in staying in Ireland. So this was a great confirmation. Uh, because when we consulted together uh, about my work and how I should go ahead, everybody was doubtful. They said, you won't get a chance to get a job in here. I said, I will because Shoghi Effendi has said I'll succeed. So they were, they, the Baha'is were rather said nothing then, you know, they just said, okay, <laughs> we will see. <laughs> and uh, George said to me that, well, you will have to try and we will we'll, we'll help you. All right. But uh, he had a great uh, sense of, lo he was very lonely as a Baha'i, very, very lonely. Because in those days now, those people who have become Baha'is and more or less every one of them left the faith afterwards. They were not really um, helpful to him. And his wife Nancy would not allow anybody to get into the house uh, because she was really tired. There was a little bungalow. She had previous to that. She had a big mansion. She had so many servants to look after and maids and servants. Now she was confined into a tiny little bungalow. And she had never been used to even make a cup of tea. I mean, she was brought up as a lady in the household. And um, therefore, George used to go himself, and I saw him many times uh, washing the floor of the kitchen and doing all kinds of things in order to, um, to live there happily that way. But gradually, um, I found a way into the household of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Townsend because I <laughs> used to be... Uh, I, I, I offered to do some work for them. Uh, Mrs. Townsend was very grateful for me to do something. There's something wrong with the electric um, iron or something like that, and I had to fix it for them. And then uh, I did mowing some of the lawn there in the house, and that was good. Oh, well, let him come in, he said, from time to time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I used to go to the house, and George used to um, lift up the phone often, uh, when I was in my office and he would uh, ring up and say come tonight and put the telephone down immediately <laughs> because he didn't want his wife to know that he had invited me you see so I used to go to the house and then we would sit down and talk about Baha'u'llah talk about various aspects of the faith he was so happy if I ever went to his house and then I had to catch a bus in those days buses from Goatstown that was the end of his line, I remember, those of you who are in Dublin. Uh, Goatstown uh, was one of the outskirts of Dublin in those days. And buses were about every hour, every hour, especially late nights. So he would come walk with me uh, from the house, literally from the house, in quite a long distance we had to go to the bus terminus. And then he would say, I wish you would miss your bus. <laughs> So that we could be together again, you see, more and more. And then the next day he said, I, I'll come tomorrow to Dublin because Mrs. Townsend wants half a pound of butter. <laughs> and uh, he would go, to, he would get on his bicycle and come to Dublin. And the bas bicycle had a little basket in front of it, you know, those old type baskets. And he would come and then he would come to me. He would leave his bicycle in our little house and then he said, let's go out. So we would go to, if it was not raining, uh, if I wasn't working at the time, we would go to Stevens Green, and if it was raining, we would go to, uh, to Bewley's and sit down there in the men's only section, of course. 
and talk about the faith and all sorts of things. This was his life. It was so much excited to have Baha'i companionship. And for many months, uh, uh, it was like this until I was able to go have work. And then, of course, we arranged to meet. He used to come, for instance, to meetings. Every, he, he never missed a meeting during the time that he was healthy and he was able to move. We used to, have, we used to hire a room in one of the streets of Dublin, wherever it was. There were so many places for Baha'i meetings. And he would come always there, whether it was cold or hot, whatever it was, he would come there. And uh, when he came, uh, he, there was practically two or three of us. Uh, the community was not very active in those days. And so we would then again go back at the end of the night. Uh, well, there are so many, for seven years, I, I used to associate with him. Really, and uh, this was a marvelous period for me, really, to be able to uh, be a part of this particular uh, family. Um, I can tell you, of course, a funnier part, but I don't want to make it very funny for you. I think I've told you last year, I don't want to repeat it again, uh, what was happening in those days in the Baha'i community in Dublin. Uh, because, all right, I'll tell you the first part, because if... <laughs> huh? Yeah. Well, we uh, used to have... Uh, when I first arrived, he said... Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, uh, two days from now, uh, I'll come to your house, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to this guest house, and we will go together to meet the Baha'is. All right. He said, they are, we are meeting in, a, in, the, in Bewley's. It's a cafe, he said. All right. So he came along, and that was how he initiated Bewley's with me. You know, you notice I go to Bewley's in the mornings nowadays <laughs> for breakfast. Uh, he, um, he came along, and uh, we went together to Bewley's. Uh, he said, this meeting, we have it every week. And I said, what about the ladies who are also, because we had three uh, we had three ladies then as members of the assembly. It was Mrs. Townsend and uh, Yuna and uh, Mrs. Uh, and uh, Lo and uh, the uh, uh, what was the name of the girls? Huh? Doris. Doris. No, not Doris wasn't there at the time. Uh, no, no, no. Well, Leslie, what was the name of the woman who took the money? Um, <laughs> Dora. Dora Coleman. Dora Coleman. Dora. Dora Coleman. Dora Coleman. <laughs> Dora Coleman. Yeah. I said, what about, what about these ladies? Oh, no, no. George said, this is only for men. Meetings for men only. We have it once a week. Oh. Uh, so all the Baha'i men would come every week. We would go into this place. And the first day that I went there, there was a Mr. Walsh there and a Mr. Price. Mr. Price was a Welsh man. Mr. Walsh was an elderly man who was um, always, uh, you could see that he has been drinking, you know, constantly. <laughs> he, he would drink alcohol and uh, going to the pub. And uh, every time he would come to our assembly meetings, in fact, he would say, well, you are not serving any, any, any drinks in here. I'm going to the pub. I'll come in a few minutes. <laughs> and uh, there was a Mr. Jones who was a very, very deaf person. And I don't want to go into that part of it also. <laughs> But anyhow, the first day that I arrived there, George Thompson said, now they, these people who are sitting in here, they all welcomed me. And they said, he, he said, they expect you to say something uh, to them about the faith. All right. But he said to me, don't talk about, don't ever mention Muhammad or Christ or Moses because Mr. Walsh doesn't believe in them and he has got a terrible temper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this was our assembly, you know, this member. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, they were members of the assembly. They were members of the assembly. I was a member of the assembly. He was a member of the assembly. 
Mr. Townsend was a member of the assembly and so on. So um, then uh, I found out later on that in fact if I ever say Baha'u'llah, Mr. Price frowns on me. <laughs> he, he says, he, he came along to me and he said, don't you talk so much about Baha'u'llah because you create personalities. <laughs> So I said, what shall I say to him? What shall I say? He said, say him. <laughs> or say he. Um, one day, um, I was in here when um, there, were, there was one of the well-known covenant breaker, a Persian covenant breaker, a per person who became a Soviet when they announced him as a covenant breaker and who changed his name. And he took the, he took the name of Perdue, uh, Joseph Perdue. That's the father of this counselor now you've got him. He was a covenant breaker. He was very much, uh, Shoghi Effendi had uh, expelled him from the faith. And he was a charlatan, as you call him in French. You know what it means? Uh, he was really in his condition. And so he had come to Europe, hiding his identity. And Shoghi Effendi had sent a telegram to say that he's a cabinet break. He came to Dublin. He had come to Dublin and he looked in the telephone directory for Mr. Townsend. So he'd ring him up and he says, I am a Baha'i and I'd like to meet with you. So George, of course, invites him to go to, um, the, uh, to the Debulis. And he rang, he rang me up and he said, look, there is a Persian gentleman has come here and I want to see him. Now, I knew this Perdu because when he was steadfast in the faith, he was the younger, he was older than me, but he was one of the uh, prominent Baha'is at the time. I've seen him many times in Iran. So anyhow, he said, this, man, this person has come. So I went in. Uh, I was a little bit late. I saw George sitting. I suddenly saw this Joseph Perdu sitting in here. So I <laughs> went out and I got the uh, waiter to a little, a little, little, little note to <laughs> George Townsend, gave it to the waiter to give it to him. And I said, this man is a covenant breaker. This is Joseph Perdue, the Shoghi friend. He has sent a telegram to that. As soon as he heard that, George stood up. He walked there, picked up his hat. And he said to him, you lied to me. And he walked out. See? So we went out that way, you see, that was how it was. But, uh, but now about this money that I was telling you, you know, we had a visitor here and that was, many people came here, those who could manage to come here to see George Townsend from Iran. Particularly there was a man called Mr. Nunu, Salim Nunu. He was a very outstanding believer and a very wealthy person, very wealthy. And uh, he came here to see George Townsend, and so I had to take him to George Townsend's house. And uh, the first thing he said, what shall I take with them for, as a gift? And because in Persia, bananas are very precious things, if you, because banana doesn't grow in north of Iran. And if you want to give the most precious thing to any person, is to give him some bananas. Now, bananas are very uh, cheap in those days. You give them a shilling, they give you a huge bunch. <laughs> he said, I want to buy some good fruit for them. And he went for bananas. I said, don't touch bananas. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a thing there. You know, he did not know this. He was very surprised. I said, this means nothing in here. He said, what shall I get? I said, well, get grapes. In those days, the only thing you could find was grapes. Uh, rather sour, but it was still... <laughs> Uh, acceptable and so forth. Anyhow, Salim Nunu came and uh, he visited George Townsend for a little while and uh, then uh, when he left he gave me 10 pounds. Now 10 pounds in those days was like really a thousand pounds now for the, for the Baha'i fund. So I um, gave this to Dora Coleman who was our treasurer. She never came again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
We lost him entirely. We lost him. But I saw, him, I saw her several times, even a few years ago. I mean, she, she was a very eloquent person, very knowledgeable person. He was, um, uh, the doc, uh, he was, a, uh, he was a, at an MA in one of these big universities in English language, and she was very articulate, beautiful speaker. You have no idea. She was Jewish background. And uh, she, she, she was a very, very, uh, very uh, great person. And... Uh, she took the money and she disappeared. Uh, but we saw her again and we never said anything to her. You know, this was how it was. Um, there are so many things I can't think of now. All kinds of things happened every day with George Townsend. And myself, we used to be so close. Pardon? Oh, yes. George took me, yes, George, the first thing he did, he said, I want you to see St. Patrick's Cathedral, uh, where I have been talking about Baha'u'llah. So I went there and I saw a very gloomy type of an atmosphere inside, dark. I said, look, George, I don't like it. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I like to see if this is your place, you have been preaching in here and teaching, but I, I'm not very uh, carried away with this sort of old place with all these statues here and there. So he said, yes, we'll go into the gardens. So every now and again we would go to the gardens of St. Patrick's Cathedral and sit down there and uh, talk about things, about things, about things, about 